involved in um, you know, organizing the life around computer games, um, also gamers and game makers. I did over 40 interviews, um, I mean, all of them face to face. I also e emailed some people, but I usually, you know, I went to visit them. I took this exact uh, uh, voice recorder and I recorded the interviews. Uh, I was also drawing from periods do period documents, um, and I will, uh, as you will see, most of the Czechoslovak scene in the 80s was pretty much underground. It was kind of semi-official, and uh, it wasn't very well documented um, in sort of mainstream official sources. So you have to kind of rely on uh, the, the, the magazines, the newsletters, the materials that the computer clubs and the amateurs produce themselves, such as these you know, uh, newsletters uh, like the Atari, a newsletter uh, that was being put out in by one of the Atari clubs in uh, in Czechoslovakia. I've been collecting uh, material artifacts um, like this this beautiful mouse. So I mean, I, I get to visit people and they show me their collections. Um, I don't really amass them. I don't really collect them. I don't own them. I usually just take or I have like really nice pictures made of them and then I return them because I don't have space to to keep all of those, but I, I'm hoping that you know some memory institution like a museum will at some point start collecting those things. And not only the official hardware that was produced in series or in mass production, but also sort of DIY projects that you will see. And I'm drawing from games themselves. So all the games that you will see, I have played. If they have a narrative, I've played them from the beginning to the end. If not, you know, I tried to play as, as much as I could. Uh, but uh, many of these games are available today thanks to the efforts of fan uh, preservationists. So, I mean, they, they collect games from their own archives and they digitize them and they put them online and you can play them there. Um, yep. A little bit about the context. I won't dwell too much on that because most of you are actually from former Czechoslovakia or from Slovakia or the Czech Republic. But, uh, but yeah, just a little bit of the context. So in the 1980s, which is the period that I will be talking about, Czechoslovakia was, uh, was, was on the kind of wrong side of the Iron Curtain. Um, it was under communist rule uh, from 1948. We're talking about the period called normalization, which came after the Soviet occupation of 1968. And uh, what it meant for computing was that there were these barriers to the flow of information, uh, knowledge, and hardware and software between the West and the East. And there was some kind of isolation, but you know, things uh, kind of found their ways into the country, but it was, it was, it was not too easy. Uh, there was no private enterprise in Czechoslovakia, so you couldn't start a software company. Uh, there was no hardware market. It was almost impossible to get, uh, to buy an actual machine in a store. Um, and I think that's about it. I think sometimes this period is described as being kind of gray and dull. Um, and uh, kind of characterized by the fact that you couldn't really realize your potential in a kind of work career or in a job career. Um, um, because, I mean, there were all kinds of barriers and only members of the Communist Party could get the good jobs and so on. Uh, so people kind of were looking for other spaces where they could realize their ambition. And one of those spaces was a hobby computing and other things like, you know, electronics, but also, you know, Building like cottages in the in the countryside and all, all kinds of things, but but uh, but yeah, people were kind of uh, thriving in these in these uh, private spaces very often, or communal spaces. Um, so saying that Czechoslovakia was on what, what you know was a state socialist country um, in the Soviet bloc doesn't really mean that it was um, like a particularly poor country. Um, it actually had pretty good standards of education, of healthcare, and so on. Um, but um, at some point, it just started becoming technologically backwards. So here you can see one of kind of the last, I think, uh, last big successes of Czechoslovak manufacturing and design, the, the Škoda 1000 MB, a beautiful car made in the 60s. Uh, but um, this car and you know all the products of the national economy in Czechoslovakia were produced by um, by industries that were centrally governed and centrally planned, and this turned out to be a big problem when it came to um, sort of com complex technologies such as computers, because with computers it was uh, it was very hard to, to to have any kind of innovation when everything's kind of centrally ordained. 
Um, so when we, and, and, and in addition to that, I mean, the policy uh, in Czechoslovakia around computers was kind of mismatched. I mean, it, it, was, it was a bit clueless. So here you can see some, I don't think I have to re read all of it, but these are some of the, kind of the official statements about uh, computers, uh, official policy statements. So basically, uh, the communist government was aware of the fact that computers are important, uh, but the mission of the computers as they saw it was to help the existing industries and the existing institutions to kind of perform their tasks more efficiently. Um, so they say, for the fulfillment of the decisive tasks of the national economy, fast development of electrotechnical industry, namely microelectronics and automation tools, is critical. But there was not really a plan to bring these computers to people. Um, as one uh, ministry official said in 1988, in 1988, which is pretty late, as a society, we are not mature enough for the general use of microcomputers. Basically kind of dismissing the calls of hobbyists and of individuals that wanted to have computers, which were not really available in the country or not, not nearly in the quantities that people uh, were asking for. There were some computers being manufactured in the country. They were never sold in stores. You couldn't buy them. They were manufactured and then sold directly to institutions. These are two of the machines that were produced here in the, in the 80s, the IQ-151. Was, uh, was made in the Czech part of the, of, of, of the country. The PMD-85, which was better, was made in Slovakia, in Pieszczany. Uh, yeah, in Pieszczany. Um, so these computers were about you know, five to six, maybe seven years behind the, sort of the, the Western standards at, the, at that point. And they were also more expensive than, <laughs> than the Western machines because they were produced in, on, on, a, on, very small scale, on a very small scale. Um, and, you know, but they had some impact. You know, people could play on them at schools. They were sold to schools and to some kind of youth, youth computer clubs and so on. But this is just to illustrate that, you know, the, the Czechoslovak economy just wasn't capable of fulfilling this demand for computers that was building up among the people. So what people did was, uh, you know, they had they had some ways of acquiring computers. Uh, you could stand in or sit or sleep in long queues in specialized stores with imported goods, um, like Tuzex. Um, and there were, you know, there were uh, similar stores in, in other parts of Eastern Europe. Um, this, is, this is a photo of people waiting for color TVs. It's not for computers, but for computers it would be the same. There was one option. Then there was the other option of uh, individually importing computers from the West. Um, so, I mean, if you were lucky enough, uh, you got a permission to travel abroad and you could buy a computer there. And uh, that's what people very often did. Uh, if they couldn't travel themselves, they asked their relatives or their friends, and they would bring computers over. It w they were I mean, immensely expensive for uh, for for a person in Czechoslovakia, but they, but the you know the fans did it anyway. Uh, the most popular computer in the country is this was the Sinclair ZX Spectrum, at least in the mm, throughout most of the 80s. Um, it was a British computer. You can see one um, actual piece of hardware downstairs at the uh, at the exhibition. There were there were a few reasons why this platform was so uh, so popular. One of them was that um, it was the cheapest available microcomputer on the Western markets for a long time, and also it was the smallest one, um, uh, which made it easier to smuggle uh, across the borders, because otherwise you would have to pay. Uh, very high customs fees, which were calculated based on the amount of RAM in the machine, and they were it was really expensive. So, I mean, people often opted to smuggle them instead. Uh, there's this ap apocryphal story, which, I mean, hasn't been verified, but seems legit, that uh, you, people would buy these box of chocolates, but they were kind of two-tier kind of box, boxes of chocolates, and they would kind of eat one part of the, of the chocolate and put the, put the spectrum inside the box and then cover it you know, with the other kind of layer of, of chocolate and smuggle the computer this way. With, uh, with the Spectrum uh, came a big influence from the British game industry. Uh, games like Manic Miner were extremely popular. It was a platformer by Matthew Smith from 1983, um, a huge British hit. You wouldn't find it in the chart that I showed you, which was kind of very American-centric. Um, and most games were circulating on, on cassette tapes. That was the sort of uh, number one uh, data storage medium at that time. 
um, in Eastern Europe. Um, in Western Europe too, like in the early 80s, um, until the mid 80s, but um, they remained being very, you know, very widely used in Czechoslovakia until the early 90s. Yeah, and the longevity of the Spectrum platform was later um, extended by by the by the Slovak clones, like the didactic uh, Gamma and and the later models produced in Skalica in Slovakia. Unofficial clones, I should say. So once people get hold of these computers, um, they kind of had to gather and work together um, because um, there was no infrastructure that would be selling software or hardware peripherals or you know, um, publish books about how to program, and how to do things with computers. So they would gather in computer clubs. Um, in order to start a club, uh, it had to have a backing of, a, of some kind of official organization, such as Svazarm, which was a paramilitary organization that kind of gathered people who did electronics and ham radio and all kinds of hobbies that could be theoretically uh, useful for the army, or the Socialist Youth Union, um, I mean, and there were other organizations, but you had to have some official, official backing. So these clubs actually had some kind of state support because the state realized that computers will be important and that it's important to kind of educate people about you know, programming and, and, and hardware and so on. But at the same time, they were sort of very open-minded spaces. Um, there was very little actual political oversight over these clubs. And I mean, at that time, Czechoslovakia was was a regime that was, I mean, not at all free. I wouldn't, I mean, it's kind of debatable if it was totalitarian, but it was very authoritative and it was not free at all and there was strict censorship. But somehow these clubs kind of got away because they were doing things that were deemed important uh, for the national economy. Uh, these clubs were these, these little spaces of freedom. And I, I have this, this one, one amazing quote by uh, one of my interviewees. He said, Back then you were born and there was a path laid out for you. You had to be a spark, iskra, that was like a uh, like socialist organization for very small kids, uh, a pioneer for bigger kids, a socialist youth for the youth, a communist when you were an adult, and then take part in the socialist economy so that you have a secure life and eventually retire. You could deviate from this in a limited number of ways. This, hobby computing, was a shortcut, something that came out of the blue, something that nobody anticipated. Here, you could fulfill your ambitions and find your talent. So it was a space in which you know, people could work on their projects without sort of much oversight. They were still not for everybody. Still, I mean, the access to uh, technology was limited, and if you look at the some of the statistics of some of the interviews, most of the people who took part in those clubs were men. There were very few women, because there were, you know, the, the prejudices about women and technology were very, I mean, pretty much the same in the Soviet bloc as they were in the West. So what happened in those clubs? So they were publishing the newsletters that I showed you, and um, then they were building hardware and building software. Um, hardware tinkering kind of came, first kind of appeared as a necessity. So. Imagine that you import a computer from the West, like a, like a ZX Spectrum, and then the keyboard breaks down, which it happened often, uh, which it often did, and um, there was no authorized service that you could send it to. You had to repair it yourself. And here you can see uh, one of these uh, DIY repair projects. So the, the original computer is in the back, and they kind of found these mechanical switches and put the keys on top of those switches and put them on this piece of plywood and connected it with, with a rainbow <laughs> wire. Um, and this was, this was actually very common. Uh, you, I mean, otherwise, your computer would be unusable. And particularly this one machine um, was actually shared between two families. They kind of pooled their resources together to buy a Sinclair computer. And then uh, the kids in both families kind of were programming and playing games on those uh, on that computer, and that's one of the reasons why the keyboard gave gave away uh, so so fast. They were making joysticks, so I mean you couldn't really buy a joystick in a store; it was um, almost impossible to get. So people were building their own, uh, like this one that I found in uh, in the in a, in a closet in one of those surviving clubs. So you can see that uh, in, instead of the handle, they, they're using this kind of button, uh, like a furniture button, basically, like for, uh, yeah, for opening, you know, closets and so on. Um, they were using four, four buttons, 
uh, they're using calculator buttons. So they basically cannibalize a, a calculator and use the buttons from there. And the rest of it is just kind of generic parts that you could buy in an electronic store at that time. Mice. <laughs> Uh, you can see that this one was built around a ping pong ball. You can even uh, you can even read the <laughs> the name of the company, the Chinese company, Double Circle, that made the ping pong ball. Uh, this was a part of like a bigger DIY kind of community project. Um, it was kind of distributed as a kit uh, that you know into the clubs and in in the club people would then kind of assemble the kits together. And they were making games too. So you can see um, an actual photo from, from a newspaper in 1986 uh, with a grammar school student, František Fuka, on the left, showing his friends at the station of young technicians his own new creation, a computer game. And you can see that the rest of the guys are kind of in awe, you know. And, uh, and one of the reasons why people were making games was to kind of impress uh, their peers. Also to entertain them, but also to kind of get credit in the community for having made a game. You couldn't really sell games. There was no infrastructure for that. And as I said, you couldn't enterprise, so um, you, you couldn't really sell them. Uh, I mean, you could sell them on black market theoretically, but nobody did that. Like People just gave them away for free. Uh, games were still getting on cassette tapes, as I said, and here you can see like, what the cassette tapes looked like. So usually it was not just a cassette with one game. It was a cassette with like a selection of games, uh, very kind of uh, serendipitous collections of games. And here you can see what kinds of games and software people were using at the time. So there are some British games like ATF. Uh, Dictator is was originally, that's a turn-based strategy game uh, which is British, but it was translated into Czech by actually by František Fuka. You can see here. Um, there were some Czech games uh, and Czechoslovak games. Um, Indiana Jones. Uh, you can see the Jones there. There, there was a text eventually about Indiana Jones, uh, which was in the Czech language, written also by Fuka. But you can also see that they have they had some kind of utility software on the same tape, so they were you know very kind of diverse collections, and people would have you know tens uh, of of such cassette tapes, and sometimes they would embellish them with these sort of beautiful drawings based on the logos of Western companies. They couldn't have the original, so at least they wanted to make make it look nice. Yeah, yeah most people didn't have access to original copies of games; they mostly arrived in the country um, in pirated copies. And uh, in a way, I already mentioned that games were probably the least regulated medium in the country just because the authorities didn't realize that they were a medium. Um, so, you know, there was no, no real censorship of, of games um, as opposed to, you know, rock music or literature or poetry and so on, which were believed to have some kind of persuasive power and uh, were believed to be able to carry um, ideological mes messages. What kinds of games were people making? So very often it started with um, emulating Western sources um, or you know, trying to make games that looked Western. Um, Star Fox, not to be confused with the Nintendo Star Fox, was a, um, uh, was a you know, shooter, uh, for, I mean, for shoot 'em up game. Um, you know, um, people were trying to pose as sort of Western developers. They were using English very often. Um, an English that was quite often kind of strange or broken or strangely poetically broken. Uh, f on, the, on, the, on the bottom right, you can see a screenshot from, uh, from Star Swallow, also a shoot 'em up, which says, good luck, fight bravely but carefully, they are angry. Uh, which is you know, the best that you can read before you start playing the game. Um, a nice example of this kind of pastiche kind of bricolage way of making games is Exotron, a game by someone named named Pez Apletal. I don't actually I haven't actually met the guy. I don't I don't I cannot find him. But it's a game called Exotron Speedy Stony Wizards Attack. Just kind of like putting together all kind of cool sounding words in English that they could find and <laughs> Uh, making the title out of them. It's not a great game, you know, they, they are using kind of graphics from different kinds of games, just kind of smashing it together like a sort of the Frankenstein monster of a game. Um, there were also games that were 
to some extent original, but we're working with sources from Western popular culture, such as the Indiana Jones games. And here you can see uh, František Fuka's Indiana Jones 2 uh, from 1987. Indiana Jones went on to become uh, one of the kind of staple characters of Czech uh, and Slovak text adventure games. Yeah, uh, over 300 games have been preserved from, uh, from the period, and more and more are surfacing. Uh, so it's, I mean, there were probably much, many more, but some of them were just lost to history. Uh, they just disappeared. Uh, but it seems that, I, I think right now, it's, it's more likely that there are about 400 um, and uh, preserved. For, for all kinds of platforms, but mostly for the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Some for the Atari and, um, and some other platforms too. At the same time, uh, there were games that um, um, had local inspirations. Um, such as Rychle Šípe, which is a text adventure based on, on, a, on, a, on a Czechoslovak comic book that was coming out in the 30s and then in the 60s. Dobývání uh, Hradu, or Taking the Castle, which is a text adventure taking place in a Czech castle. Piškvorks, <laughs> um, uh, which, uh, which is an adaptation of the Czechoslovak, I don't know, Central European version of Tic-Tac-Toe, which is a very interesting version of tic-tac-toe because unlike tic-tac-toe it's it's played it's being played on an open field so it's sort of like an open world tic-tac-toe you're only uh you're only limited by the amount of uh, you know graph paper that you have and even in this game you can sort of scroll to the left and to the right in that seemingly infinite playing field and you have to have actually five not three uh, symbols in a, in a row or a diagonal so that was a sort of local non-digital game and uh, they were making games inspired by their sort of uh, own life games that were autobiographical. And those are the ones that I will be talking about now. And, um, and this brings me to, so uh, before I start talking about them, I, would, I, would just, try, I just want to mention uh, some of the recent trends in indie games. Um, I mean, indie games are still considered something new. Um, and, um, it's interesting th to think about where people get inspiration for indie games. Um, and there's this uh, pretty influential book called The uh, Rise of the Video Game Zinsters by the game designer Anna Anthropy. And um, she's sort of trying to inspire people to make new kinds of games and to find inspiration in other places that people usually do. And uh, there's a whole chapter which is just a list of things that you can make games about. Your dog, your cat, your child, your boyfriend, your friends, your imaginary friends, your summer vacation, your winter in the mountains, your childhood home, your current home, your future home, and this list goes on and on and on. And in a way, that's what people did uh, here in the 80s already. Um, I call some of these games that I'll be showing you hyperlocal games, uh, games created by people from a particular place about that place and about the people who inhabit it, written mainly but not exclusively for the local community. So one of them was uh, Fuxsoft, which you can play downstairs. It's a, it's a game that takes place uh, in like a fictional apartment building somewhere in Slovakia. So it's partially hyperlocal. It's not really tied to a particular place, but it's very autobiographical. Uh, it features some of the author's friends as characters and so on. There's another example, which is, which is Czech. Uh, it's called Demon in Danger, and it's... Uh, and here you can see so the, 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 the title screen, the, the intro. On November 13th, 1988, a strange person appeared in the village of Chlebe, which is close to Prague. He was wearing an army uniform and an army hat. Those who know games for the ZX Spectrum would recognize him as Dan Dare, a comics hero. He was an agent of the studio Fuxsoft, constructed by František Fuka. His mission is to plant a bomb into the apartment of the competing studio Demon, that is, into the apartment of Martin Mali. And this game takes place in the apartment of Martin Mali, who's the author of the game. And uh, you have to save Martin Mali from the explosion that is sort of upcoming. Uh, very, it's coming very soon, and you have like a limited amount of time before the explosion happens, so you have to be pretty fast. Um, yeah, and uh, the game actually takes place in this apartment, which, I mean, still exists. Uh, it's, uh, here you can see it on Google Maps, and this is the building where the game takes place. And even when you draw the map of the game, it actually, um, you know, it looks like, it feels like an actual kind of 1950s, 60s, uh, you know, Czechoslovak Bitovka apartment. And you can, you can walk around the apartment. Of course, I mean, you have to solve the puzzles to win the game, but you can also kind of look at the rug and see, you know, like 
the brand of the rug and like the the price of the rug and you can you can kind of you can you can look at the TV and and all these things. So you can vicariously can experience what it was like to live in Czechoslovakia in the 1980s. And it was not the only one. Uh, yeah, and you can go you can go into Demon's office, which is where the author made the game. And uh, you know, like if you look at the actual photo of Demon's office, it's it doesn't look as cool as it's called. It's just this kind of crammed little space with a Sinclair Spectrum and a small CRT TV. Um, yeah, I've actually this this is a game that takes place in Bratislava, but I actually haven't played it yet. It surfaced. Uh, it, it it just appeared very recently in in the fan archives. Um, yeah, so I just I just want to throw it out here. If if you want to play a game that, that takes place in in Slovakia, this takes place in Bratislava. And it's inspired by Boni Akle, the, so the 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 movie about the hustlers of late socialisms, made by um, a person that called himself Romantic Softman, <laughs> which is so cool. But I want to show you another game. Um, this is actually from 1992, but it continues in this trend of making games about personal experiences. It's called Stodman, and it takes place in the, in, in the town of Stod in Western Bohemia, uh, West, in Western Czech Republic. And uh, it takes place in the high school that the author went to. And I'll just uh, let the author explain what the game is about. Stodman jako postava je hrdina. Tady je dobrý zmínit, že jsem se s tou postavou ne úplně na začátku, ale někdy během vymýšlení hry identifikoval. Takže jde vlastně o mě. Respectman byl Pája Korbel. Hlavní hrdina Stodman se dostane do školní budovy, zapadnou za ním dveře, zamknou se, v té školní budově musí získat materiály z výslechů Stodmena a Respektmena a tyto materiály v příslušný datový podobě poslat tajné organizaci, která zajistí chycení a potrestání příslušných vyníků. A posledním úkolem je uniknout z budovy školy. je malej, potřebuje chránit. Potřebuje nějakou berličku nebo nějakou posilu. Takže tohle, to, co vidíte, je fantazie. Na druhou stranu tuhle bundu jsem nosil skutečně, podobný brejle jsem nosil skutečně, nikoliv jako ochranu fyzickou, ale jako spíš způsob psychického zastrašování. Pixla zakomplexovaná byla výchovná poradkyně, skutečný jméno Ivanka Nosková. Přestože zní takhle rostomilé, tak ta paní měla na svědomí mě takhle s tím pájou, jak se pokusila nás, jak řekněme, dostat do spárů psychiatra. Vždycky si z ročníku někoho vyhlídla přesvědčila ho nebo ho uvrtala do nějakého problému a pak ho posílala do poradny do Havlovic. Okay, this is uh, from a from a student film uh, made uh, by by a student at the Vesh MU in in Bratislava actually, but the film still hasn't been released. Uh, but it's it some parts of it are have have been finished. Um, yeah, and then the, the f I kind of collaborate on the film, and it's based on on the research that I did. 
Um, so, so you could see that this game reacted to some some very traumatic personal experiences that these people had, and it was a way in which um, they could fight back. Uh, it was it was it, it was very empowering to be able to you know create a game in which you could rel relive these experiences from the position of an empowered hero, not uh, Jan Lonsky, you know, but uh, the actual person, but Stodman, like this kind of superhero version of the same person who can fight back against the oppression. Um, as uh, the author himself puts it, we weren't weak. We had our own powers and abilities. One of them was the ability to express ourselves in a way that cannot be intercepted by them, by those in power. And in this case, uh, these were school authorities, but you know, in the 80s, uh, they were communist authorities. And there was also some kind of overlap because, uh, I mean, at least he thinks that some of the people uh, that were on the school board and were kind of abusing them were actually kind of old communists. So, so let's go a little bit back into the 80s um, and, and look at more examples. So, so in the uh, late 80s, uh, there were some important uh, uh, political developments, uh, starting in the Soviet Union, where uh, starting with Gorbachev and his uh, reforms, like Glasnost and Perestroika, it seems that things were becoming a bit more liberal. Um, in Czechoslovakia, not so much, but still, people were becoming less and less afraid to voice their opinions because they knew that change was possible. And this also was reflected in, in the kind of new computer games uh, that were becoming more and more uh, kind of critical uh, of, uh, of the communist regime or more and more kind of adventurous. Um, one of them, which is more kind of funny than uh, than critical, is, is the game Shatochin, which is exhibited uh, downstairs. Um, it's a game made in Bratislava, uh, Slovakia, by uh, by the team called Sibilasoft, uh, five high schoolers. And the the main character here is Major Shatochin of the Soviet Red Army, um, whom uh, who was well known from this movie uh, Solo Journey, which was the Soviet answer. Uh, to the Rambo movies, uh, Soviet propaganda machine realized that they were kind of they couldn't hold up uh, with uh, with the keep up with with the West, and they were trying to create their own Rambo. They failed, but uh, but anyway, this guy became the the hero of this game. Then, th so this is the opening screen. Then the next thing you see is this Soviet uh, iconography. No one really respected that symbol anymore, and it was there for laughs. Uh, say the authors. Uh, Shatohin posed as an exemplary pro regime game with you know the title in Cyrillic and all these symbols, but the jokes inside the game poked fun at it, and no one could reprimand me for making such a game because the first visual impression is that of a Soviet hero. What actually happens in the game so your goal is to kill John Rambo or uh, to destroy John Rambo uh, but uh, you know on your way to doing that. Uh, the main character, Major Shatokhin, dies many humiliating deaths. Because the game doesn't, I mean, the game is not really fair. You know, you will die. Um, and you will die, you know, in humiliating ways and in very funny ways. So, in a way, they're sort of subverting the status of this Soviet hero uh, through this game. It's a, it's a very funny and game, and it was very influential. Another one is a game called Reconstruction. Here you can see that they're playing uh, specifically, I mean, explicitly with. Uh, with the idea of perestroika, which means reconstruction, or prestavba uh, in Czech and prestavba in, in Slovak. Uh, it was released anonymously, uh, but uh, now we actually, in, we actually know who made it. Uh, it was made by Miroslav Fiedler from Prague, who otherwise made very complex uh, text adventures and action games. But here he says, I was so ingenious that in order for the secret police not to catch me, I made the game awfully primitive, um, so that nobody could tell that he actually made it. Uh, the game is dedicated to the 20th anniversary of the liberation of Czechoslovakia by the uh, you know, Soviet army. Uh, yeah, that was actually the start of the occupation in 1968, so this is clearly ironic. Uh, the goal of the game is to uh, blow up uh, and destroy a statue of uh, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, who was you know, one, of, one of the symbols of uh, the communist ideology. Um, on, I'll just leave this for a bit. There are some kind of fun mechanics uh, and some fun puzzles. In order to go get through like a darkened corridor, you have to uh, you have to set ablaze a copy of Marx's Capital, the the book. Uh, 
and in order to do that, uh, you have to use a Soviet lighter. Um, and the, if you if you examine the lighter, it says I mean it was made in in the Soviet Union, so probably it's it's high, very high quality. Uh, but um, and this is where I got stuck when I was was first playing the game. Uh, it just didn't work for me. Um, and you know usually. Um, I mean, randomness is not usually uh, like a mechanic in text adventure games, but here it is. Uh, the lighter only works with 30% chance, so you have to try again. I actually found out by hacking into the code of the game and kind of figuring out what I have to do. Uh, but yeah, that's that's like a the commentary on quality of Soviet products. At the end, uh, the game displays this message. Congratulations once more. We will all meet on August 21st on Old Town Square or anywhere else. Basically, explicitly inviting people to take part in anti-regime demonstrations commemorating the 20th anniversary of Soviet occupation. It was a naive protest of sorts, says uh, Miroslav Fiedler. Um, another game uh, takes place during the Palach Week demonstrations in January 1989. It was a peaceful demonstration commemorating the sacrifice of uh, the student Jan Palach in 1969, um, which was, and the demonstration was uh, brutally suppressed by the police. And uh, a game was made about it uh, called The Adventures of Indiana Jones in Vencesa Square in Prague on January 16, 1989. So here you can see that Indiana Jones resurfaces. Um, and it's, this is a very violent game. You can play downstairs. Um, it's, it's very violent, it's a very angry game which makes me believe that the author might have been a person who actually took place in demonstrations, probably got beaten up. And uh, once again, you kind of revisit the place where you know you were wronged, and then you can kind of rectify this, this time as, as Indiana Jones. So you will die a lot in this game. Like here, you're standing at an unobstructed entrance into the subway. As soon as you showed up, an officer came to you and searched you. Having found nothing, he called his comrades and they beat you senseless and so on and so on. And then you commit harakiri, Indiana Jones is dead. At the same time, uh, you can uh, dispose of uh, you know, members of the police in very brutal ways. Um, I'll start from an annoying man, probably a communist, is looking out of a balcony and happily watching the good work of the members of the public security, which was uh, the official title of uh, the police. You can go down to the right or inside. You see a cop, and I've found an axe. I see. Use axe. You drove your axe so deep inside his skull that it cannot be pulled out. You see a dead cop, and and you go on like this. Uh, yeah, for about you know there are like 18 locations on Vesta Square. It's geographically very kind of um, faithful to the actual uh, layout of Vesta Square in Prague. Um, and at this point, almost each major demonstration, and uh, anti-regime demonstration, had a game written about it, which I found find very amazing. Um, so, on the 17th, on the 17th of uh, of November, um, uh, one of the most, uh, I mean, one of the final um, anti-regime demonstrations took place. Uh, the one, the, the real game changer, in Prague. Actually, there was a demonstration in Bratislava the day before that people don't really know about. I mean, people in the Czech Republic don't know about, but I know about it. But yeah, but this this was the, m the more the more famous one. On the 17th, um, once again, uh, protest uh, student protesters were beaten up brutally by the police, um, and while one of the most famous slogans was Nechtsemenasi, or we don't want violence. And once again, there's a game about it, uh, repeating the slogan. Um, the game is quite simple. Uh, your goal is to find a video camera and, f and, and film footage of uh, police brutality and then send it to uh, foreign journalists so that the world kind of finds out about what's happening. And um, I think that this theme of looking for the truth is very important because at that time, the media were dominated by the Communist Party, and it was very hard to actually find genuine, kind of unbiased information about what was happening. Um, yeah, and there's this one thing that was bugging me about this title screen. So this is the loading screen of the game. It's a text adventure. Uh, this is the only graphic um, present in the game. And it felt a bit strange, because the, the face of the guy just seems like so much more high-res than the rest of the graphic. And then finally, one day, I found out uh, that it's just a redrawn image from this game, The Way of the Exploding Fist, which is an Australian uh, sort of beat em, it's not a beat em, it's like a yeah, fighting game, like Mortal Kombat. Uh, 
And so they basically just took the graphic and, and made this karate guy into a police police guy. Once again, kind of showing how this, this bricolage approach to, uh, to making games was dominant. Well, just sort of one final note. You know, when you read about political games and activist games and serious games, I mean, the histories really don't go that far, that far back. And you know, the most kind of cited examples are from the early 2000s, but you can see that you know, games like that had been uh, made already in the 80s in Czechoslovakia. So just to sum up a few conclusions, takeaways. I'm not saying that um, this kind of, these uses of games, these political activist resistance use of games were exclusive to the Czechoslovak context. Similar games were probably made in other countries too, but they just haven't been documented yet. So, you know, there's a lot of work for historians in other countries. Uh, 1980s computer clubs, in a way, were predecessors to the game jam culture. They were very open-minded spaces in which people weren't primarily motivated by profit, but they were motivated by you know sharing things with other people, and uh, it was a very supportive environment in in many ways. So although you know this happened in a very kind of kind of perverted uh, way, you know, they just had to do it with the backing of a parameter organization. The actual functioning of these clubs was very similar to what we can see in game jams. Uh, games have always been indie in a way. You know, you can see this in these you know 80s games that were very personal um, and very original and, and and often very political, like sometimes some indie games are. And it shows that already in the 1980s, uh, you know, these kids uh, and young people in Czechoslovakia um, realized that games are an incredibly versatile medium of expression. And that's it for me. Thank you. I'll be taking questions. Thank you. Hello. Are there any questions? If you have a question, please raise your hand. Over there. Um, you mean games about contemporary events? Okay, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I'm not really about living under communism. I'm not aware of it, but someone can uh, correct me. Uh, there, there is a series of games, series of educational games about living under Nazi occupation. Uh, they are being produced in Prague as sort of a non-profit collaboration between um, a university and some kind of other uh, entities. Um, uh, one of them, called Attentat 1942, has actually been quite successful uh, and has been released commercially as well. So that's that's one example. And then you know there are s there are some games that kind of comment on on kind of con on current political events. Uh, there's one called um, in you know in, in in the Czech Republic. There's one called uh, Pussy Walk. Uh, which, and some people know it, I can see. Uh, I uh, no, 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 I mean, it would just take too much time. Uh, but um, it's, it's a game that kind of parodies uh, our current president, Miloš Zeman, who's uh, portrayed um, as like this kind of wobbly drunk who's uh, kind of, um, yeah, based on some reports, happens often. Um, and uh, and it make, basically makes fun of him. And there was one version of the game that was basically made just to make fun of him, and then there was another version uh, released before presidential elections, uh, which he won anyway. So you know, political games probably don't have that much impact, uh, but you know it was worth. Uh, I think it was worth trying. Any other questions? Uh, so what's next for you now after you wrote the book and like sort of closed one chapter of your research? Yeah, that's a good question. So I've always been interested in more things than just video game history. So I'm working on the project on monsters in video games, so the, uh, the history and aesthetics of video game monsters. But in terms of history, I think there's one one project that's very current and and and. and Actually, I, I think I have to work on it a little bit today. And that is, we're, we're trying to remake some of these games, such as uh, this one 
and the Indiana Jones game and Reconstruction. Um, uh, yeah, this one. Uh, we're remaking them for uh, into JavaScript, so they're playable in the browser, and also this would allow us to translate them into other languages, so that sort of people in other countries can also uh, play these games. Um, and this is um, this is funded by the Institute for Contemporary History in in the Czech Republic in Prague as uh, as a part of the uh, program for the 30th anniversary of uh, the Velvet Revolution. And after that, I mean, I'm definitely probably not in not immediately, but at some point, I, I kind of want to continue this this history project and and um, and look at what was happening in the 90s in the transformation era. Can you play the games somewhere now? Like, are they accessible mm -hmm. online? Are they accessible through um, yep. emulators? Yep. Uh, I think I have a slide that I removed, but it's somewhere here. Yeah. Um, so. Um, most of, I mean, all of these games are available online. I mean, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be able to kind of access them otherwise. Um, they were digitized by, 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 by the efforts of fan preservationists, uh, pres you know, preservation enthusiasts. Um, and I'm kind of collaborating with them and I'm crediting them uh, in the book as well because they're doing Im you know, immensely important work. Um, so there's this archive called uh, the Czechoslovak uh, Specky uh, Archive. Actually, yeah, in English, it's, people told me that it's actually pronounced Specky, not Specky. Uh, the Czechoslovak Spectrum Archive, where you can find most of the games for the Spectrum. And then there are separate archives for the Atari, for the Sharp MZ800 and other platforms, and PMB85, and all these separate platforms. It's not very well organized, though. Uh, so I think that they're... I'm hoping that at some point, like a memory institution, like a museum, will actually kind of create an archive that's better organized and has some metadata as well. But I mean, still, this is this is what we have, and I'm very grateful for it. Um, and then, when you download uh, the files, you can you can play them in emulators, or you can play them some of them downstairs, which you're very welcome to do. It's super interesting. Uh, okay. If nobody else has a question, I probably have the last one. And it would be a question about, I forgot what I wanted to ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh. it, was, it was probably the best question. It of, was the of, best of question of ever, yes. Of all time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, anyway, Yaroslav, very much. Thanks Yaroslav for will be here uh, running around in the festival until tomorrow. Yep. Uh, feel free to ask him anything, invite him for a beer, talk to him. He has a lot of very... I know, I know. <laughs> now I know, yes. Uh, okay, so we were talk you were talking mostly about, uh, about games that were sort of anti-regime oriented. Mm -hmm. yep. Are there any examples of pro-regime oriented games? Yeah, that's... Um, that's a good question, but n not really. So there was one, uh, I, d I don't think I actually have a, yeah, uh, I don't have a screenshot here. But there was there was one that kind of came out with the official backing of the Pioneer Organization, which was like a socialist youth organization. But otherwise the content was just like a sci-fi text adventure, so it wasn't really about being a good communist or anything. Then there was one game promoting a specific factory uh, like a mine in Ostrava somewhere, like a coal mine. And uh, the main character was a miner. It was probably like a reference to Manic Miner, the British game. Uh, but it was, it was not a very good game. Uh, it came out like, yeah, in the very late 80s. But apart from that, I think that the, the, the authorities, the, the Communist Party didn't really realize the power of games. And th at that time, they were still kind of niche. You know, there weren't that many people. Uh, playing them, so so I, do, I, do, I don't think they considered using games as a tool of propaganda. Right. So, thank you very much, Jaroslav Schwelch. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs> now we will have a very short break, and coming next will be another lecture by Helios Moro about designing his game in a very accessible uh, way, which we're very much looking forward to. So, you're welcome to come again.